Hello and welcome to Bloke on the Range. It's the 25th of April 2021 and this is uh, this year's Varastalika Remote Military March and because we couldn't just do it simply, we're doing it Battle of Merton themed. Um, of course, in vague costume. Now, um, Battle of Merton happened on the 22nd of June 1476 and is one of the sort of defining battles in the formation of the nascent Swiss Confederation. And we've actually got sort of the main two parties represented and some of the mercenaries because here we have Pascal who has featured on the channel before who is Swiss and is dressed as a Swiss and he missed out last year when we were uh, waltzing it up in Second World War era gear so he's he's making up for that now <laughs> and it's going to be Scorchio today. Yep. Chappie was actually born in Burgundy. Born in Dijon so, so home uh, of the Dukes. Yes, indeed, and I'm English, therefore representing the English archers who are fighting on the side of the Burgundians. Now, uh, what we're going to do while we go around is uh, we'll talk about the kit at various points and we'll sort of discuss salient points of the approach to the battle. Um, we're going to walk, we're in, we're in uh, Spiel here, which is near Frauenkappelen, near Bern. Now, imagine you're a farmer, you've been tilling your field, you've had the call up from your local Vogt or Lord. Um, you grab your halberd or your pike and uh, you're going to walk towards the battle and we're going to sort of follow a fairly um, well, realistic route. We're going to um, go up to the to the marshalling area in Ulmitz. So from the marshalling area in Ulmitz we're going to go through the, uh, the, the sort, of sort of forming up area, their, their line of departure, the main line of Burgundian defences. Um, we're then going to sort of swing around to the south a bit and go through the chapel at Cressier where legend has it that the uh, the Swiss Confederate commanders prayed on the night, obviously the chapel's been rebuilt since because they burned down as they tended to do uh, <laughs> over the centuries. Um, I'm highly skeptical of this, um, I think it's rather, rather a legend and we'll explain why when we're there and you'll see it on the ground. From there we're going to walk um, northwards towards Merton up onto the Bodomancy where we've been before for the Merton Schiessen competition because that's shot from the top of the bottom and see and that's where Charles the Bold, the Burgundian commander, had his command post. We'll give a very very brief overview of the battle uh, because it's a big topic in and of itself and that's much easier for me to do on my own without it being in the middle of a 25 kilometre walk carrying at least 10 kilos of gear plus water and food. Um, I think Pascal's carrying rather more than that. Oh, well. <laughs> um, and uh, we'll finish off at the War Memorial, which is up on the up on the shore by Merrier. And uh, yeah, hopefully it'll be at least vaguely interesting. We won't bore you to tears, but we've got 25 kilometers ahead of us and it sets off that way. So some of this route is gonna be on marked walking routes, Van der Vega. Um, I've actually prepared a map and I'll put a link in the description below so you can see the route we're planning on taking and hopefully we'll actually manage to stick with it. But I have the navigational skills of a junior officer, so. <laughs> There's no promises. Anyway, first step, Heggy Dawn, that way, allegedly 45 minutes, but these are rather more leisurely assumptions of time. So, off we go. Well, ladies and gentlemen. person to look at us is screaming. Okay, <laughs> Later. Plus four, kilometre in, 24 to go. Nice little stroll through a middle land forest. Guess it doesn't look anything like it would have done in medieval times. Yeah, because it's, uh, it's far too. Idea. Yeah, it would have been managed entirely differently. Yeah. And Lindy Beige has a video on this topic of what woodlands look like in the Middle Ages. The answer is not like this with conifers and junk. So uh, the search function will help you find that one. Soon after. Flashbacks to history school. <laughs> to, to history lessons. Who was the king in. Uh, hello! <laughs> <laughs> Louis the something. Yeah. How, 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 how's Someone it. With uh, a massive cog piece. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or high heels. 50 50. <laughs> or both. <laughs> so, so, how's the, uh, the gear holding up? It's actually not that bad. The wool is a little warm. Um, but the backpack isn't too bad because it's quite stable, it doesn't move around much. Um, it's heavy and hard, but 
because it's a backpack and not connected to my other stuff, I just can lift it up or support it with my hands up front. So for just walking around, decent for the air. I, I mean, it's 1880s technology, so you know, it could be worse. It's half a cow you to carry on around, but yeah. <laughs> All right, so we're now exactly three kilometers in. Everybody's still smiling. And I um, thought we'd kick off the whole story by explaining who or what Burgundy was first. And not just an overpriced wine. Yeah, because as a nowadays it's part of France, but it wasn't always. So uh, we'll go, I'm gonna skip huge chunks of history. Um, we start in the 9th century, when Burgundy is a uh, one of the broken off parts of the Frankish Empire. Then it stays as an autonomous state. It comes in and out of um, the French realm, which is very small back then. Um, and then we come, into, uh, come to 1363, where it officially becomes part of the French realm once again, or Kingdom of France. Uh, but the uh, Burgundian nobles are rather used to their semi-autonomy and they make it clear that they will wish to remain so even if they are incorporated into the realm. Uh, to avoid any political crisis, um, John II of France says, okay, I will renounce my right as king, but my son, Philip the Bold, will take over as uh, Duke of Burgundy. Uh, he is rather ambitious and drives for even more independence. And um, then we skip to uh, his marriage to someone who I haven't written down, but it gives him basically all of uh, Brabant and Flanders and Luxembourg, which is at the time an enormously powerful textile region, immensely rich. Um, so potentially that gives him territories from the North Sea all the way down to Burgundy, which is more or less level with Switzerland. Uh, there are a couple of states between there, so he doesn't have the entire corridor. And basically the main aim from that point is to join up the territories. Um, so then we have the successor to uh, Philip the Bold, John the Fearless, because they had awesome names back then, who, uh, is then overtly hostile to France, as in they are having fisticuffs, um, because Burgundy basically has more political and financial clout than France does. And on the other side of them is the Habsburg Empire, so they are sort of a buffer between the two. Then we have uh, John the Good, so a slightly better name, uh, who is allied to Edward V, so here comes the British, now the Burgundians are quite happy to hire anybody and make friends with anybody <laughs> to obtain their political goals. And uh, so John the Good, it's under John the Good that Joan of Arc is captured and uh, handed over to the British and... English. Yes, English and burnt. Although the English didn't burn her, the Burgundians did. <laughs> <laughs> That's conveniently forgotten, isn't it? <laughs> um, so yeah, and then the allegiance with England goes backwards and forwards when it's convenient. Uh, and then we get to the one we're interested in, the last Duke of Burgundy, Charles the Bold. And um, he officially wants to get the, the state recognised as an official kingdom. So he wants to be crowned. Um, and he almost succeeds. Uh, first of all, he refuses all tributary ties to France. So that's definite cut-off. And um, he actually initiates formalities for legitimization in front of the Holy Roman Empire under Frederick III. Uh, all the papers are signed, all that's remaining to do is the coronation, uh, but the eve before Frederick III changes his mind and runs away <laughs> during the night. Uh, apparently there was something to do with his daughter having to be buried to someone in Burgundy and he didn't like the sound of that, so he, he disappeared. Um, and, uh, well, I mean, ultimately, at the end of all that, he dies at the Battle of Nancy in 1477, and then the Burgundian Empire is broken up between Kingdom of France and the Habsburg Empire. And thus ends 
the state of Burgundy. So Chappie's commending this year's water because last year's tasted of rust. Yeah, I had bits floating in the, my World War II <laughs> water bottle. <laughs> it was pretty nasty. And he broke a strap as well. <laughs> oh, I broke my strap on live on camera. <laughs> so geographically here, I don't know if you can, if the camera's good enough to show it, but this is the Middle Land, which is the flattish bit of Switzerland between the Alps to the south and the Jura to the north. And this is the bit where all the interesting stuff happens economically and historically, because in the mountains, well, it's just like mountains in it, they just come out of the sky and stand there. <laughs> if you get that reference, I'll be impressed. So, having told you a bit about uh, Burgundy itself, our topic of today is the Burgundian Wars. So uh, this fits in in the, uh, the end of my previous story with the, the death of uh, Charles the Bold. And uh, now we'll see about how the Burgundian Wars kicked off. Behind me we have Jura, Chasseral area, and the Burgundians would have been coming from over there. So, uh, Burgundian Wars, we start in uh, 14, uh, 1469 when uh, Sigismund of Habsburg, um, Duke of Austria, is rather worried about the Confederates at the time, who are rather pushier than they are now, <laughs> and um, he wants to have uh, a buffer against them. And first of all, he goes and asks France, who are a rival power, who say, no. And so he asks the Burgundians, who say, sure, whatever. And uh, in exchange for the help, the uh, Habsburgs give a portion of Alsace and the Black Forest territories, the neighboring the Confederacy, and um, the, uh, I would say, governor of the region is rather, rather uh, forceful and enforces some quite stringent trade sanctions on the, um, particularly the cities trading along the Rhine, including Basel. Uh, restrictions on grain uh, export and that kind of thing. And they don't like that, so they go to uh, burn these states and say, help, they're being mean to us. And um, to try and alleviate that, Sigismund realizes that actually the Confederacy isn't pushing into the Habsburg territories at the moment, so he changes sides, attempts to buy back the territories he sold to Burgundy, who say no, again. And um, so then we have uh, a league that's formed between Habsburgs, uh, Bern, Solothurn, and the Rhine, the oppressed Rhine city-states. And then we have the Battle of Herincourt in uh, 1474, which is League 1, Burgundy, nil. Um, then we have, in uh, not strictly related to the Burgundian Wars, but in uh, 1475, uh, the Bernese retake Vaux and Valais, uh, which I recently learned with substantial financial help from uh, the King of France back then. Um, so the Bernese, well, the Confederacy is bolstered and uh, gains a bit of confidence. Uh, during that time, Charles the Bold is trying to unify his northern and southern territories by trying to take Lorraine. And he does that finally by taking Nancy, which is the, the, the main seat of power there, in uh, 1476. And um, then he turns his attention back to this new league that's formed, which is uh, pushing on his bound borders, and we get to the first big battle that concerns us today, Grandson. This next turn, right or left? Just, uh... Well, the next part that we're looking at is the Battle of Grandson, which is one of the three battles that the Swiss fought with the Burgundians. Well, um, it, the whole thing started at 19th February of 1476, when Charles comes up to Grandso with um, roughly 20,000 men. And on the 21st of March, he starts to besiege, he starts to besiege the town of Grandson. 
Um, the garrison of Corso were only around 500 men and during the siege they lost a couple. So at the 28th of, of uh, February they uh, surrendered. The roughly around 412 uh, of the garrison who were left surrendered to the um, Burgundians. Initially they were promised to uh, be spared, but uh, Charles made quite a mistake in uh, letting himself get pressured into executing them by uh, the towns of war who had uh, suffered previously uh, under the Swiss. So uh, they, the 412 men were executed by either hanging them on multiple people on one tree or by uh, drowning them in uh, the lake. Then next part uh, was the Swiss, uh, the Swiss reinforcements coming around uh, from the north at the 2nd of March. And those were around 18,000 people, 18,000 men, mostly Swiss and some Habsburg cavalry. At first they were sending around um, the vanguard, roughly a thousand men, a thousand to two thousand men of vanguard were approaching and due to bad reconnaissance of the Burgundians, Charles mistook them for the whole Swiss force. So he attacked them north of uh, the town of Conson. Um, long story short, it ended by um, the Burg Burgundians trying to shell them into pieces with their artillery, attacking them with the cavalry. Didn't quite work out because um, the Swiss were approaching in a pike formation, the Gewalthaufen, and so he tried to lure them in further into the field of battle to shell them some more and he started to rearrange his troops to redeploy them and while he was doing that in the chaos of movement of formations the rest of the Swiss approached the battle and the whole movement turned to chaos and the whole um, of the Burgundian army was routed more or less immediately. Um, the losses were on both sides rather um, non-significant roughly a hundred men for the Swiss and roughly a thousand men for the Burgundians. Of course because most of, the, most of the Swiss were on foot and there was only a small detachment of Habsburg cavalry, they didn't manage to actually catch the Burgundians and um, basically end the war right then and there. So the Burgundians managed to um, flee and Charles the Bold with his bodyguards managed to get big part of his treasury in his field camp out of there and flee towards Lausanne. Now the big part about the Battle of Conso is the loot that the Swiss managed to capture in that field camp because the Burgundians basically just routed and ran off leaving the field camp full of stuff for the Swiss to loot. Um, some of it is more like folklore and quite a lot of stuff is actually confirmed to have been there. Um, for some stuff I have prices actually um, with um, inflation in mind, so um, I will give you a few things of that. Well, the, probably the most important part that got captured were um, weapons and armor that were used later on in the war as well. Big part of it were 419 modern artillery pieces, up to 800 firearms, um, arquebuses, and up to 300 tons of gunpowder. Then um, a bunch of the Burgundians had, um, or especially Charles the Bold, had a bad habit of carrying a lot of treasure with him into the field as good luck charm and to show off. So, what was confirmed to be captured in the tents in the tents of the field camp were things like carpets, carpets that belonged to Alexander the Great, um, Charles' personal ceremonial sword, up to two thousand horses and um, 27 decorated silk banners and so on, 400 silk tents. Now for the prices that's probably a little more interesting. You have um, Charles State Seal, that was a one, half a kilo piece of gold that um, at the time was uh, worth, like uh, converted to modern currency, um, 78,105 Swiss francs, which is roughly the same in dollars. Um, then. That's kind of funny as well. Charles silver bathtub, roughly 250 kilograms of pure silver, which would be around 562 and 250 Swiss francs back then. And one last thing that's kind of interesting is that the Three Brothers Jewel, which um, was captured that day, that became later on um, a crown jewel of uh, the English royal family. 
And if you look up uh, paintings on, of uh, Queen Elizabeth, she's wearing them quite often in the paintings. And um, that was captured at there and together with three other diamonds found in the hoard of Charles the Bold, they were sold in um, 1504 to um, first to Basel, then in fr uh, first it was sold to Basel, then in 1504 it was sold to a German banker and he sold, he bought it in 1504 for 40,200 florins, which is in Swiss francs, with inflation in mind, 22,200,114 Swiss francs for a necklace. And um, that gives you kind of an idea how much stuff the Swiss were able to capture, which would provide funds for future campaigns and more importantly for the war effort right now, a lot of modern artillery. So I'm standing here by the old bridge, uh, having just crossed the Sana River here at Guminen. And as a reminder, Charles has fled down to sort of friendly territory down in Lausanne, Canton Vaux. And uh, he's got two choices to, to get to Bern, to defeat the Bernese. One via, um, uh, via Fribourg, the other via Merton. And uh, of course the Bernese understand this, they garrison both of these towns and it's the, the, the entire politics between the free bourgeois and the Bernese with this, it's kind of complicated, it goes a bit beyond the scope of this video, um, but basically they were garrisoned, it was anticipated that one or the other was going to happen. Uh, Charles decides he's going to go the more sort of northerly route over Merton. It's not entirely clear why. It's entirely possible that um, sort of a scouting party got, in, got into a fight at uh, Atol near Coudrefin, on the, on the southern side of Lake Neuchatel and that made him decide to go that way but in any case he did go that way so he rocks up on the 9th of June and starts to try and besiege the town trying to destroy the, the outer wall with his remaining artillery which is mostly of the less good type having lost all the super modern, hyper modern stuff at Grandson. So um, on the 12th of June he sends out some advanced parties one here at Guminen to try and cross the uh, uh, cross the Sana, and further to the south, another one at Laupen to cross the Sensa, to try and to try and possibly just either reconnoiter or even possibly just to it, try and sort of make a surprise victory or something. Anyway, he did this, and both of them got utterly trounced. They were completely trounced, no question. Um, this is another unforced error because it's not the loss of the troops that matters so much, but it's the triggering of the Swiss mutual defence pact with other cantons and with other people outside the uh, outside of Switzerland, like for instance the Lorrainians. So uh, anyway, Charles, just as a, as a general thing, Charles seems to be making an awful lot of unforced errors. And uh, this is not the last unforced error that we're going to be talking about on this walk. Still buttoned up. <laughs> you seeing this is a bit of a personal challenge? Yeah. To stay buttoned up as long as you possibly can? Yeah, definitely. What was uh, Swiss World War II policy on staying buttoned up? Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, people always think NCOs in the Swiss Army are career military. They're not. They're militia as well. Especially like a certain era when I got in NCO school, it's a four week crash course basically. So, and nowadays at least you make like a whole basic training. When I got in, it was like in the middle of a basic training, make a four week crash course, yeah, you're NCO now. And it was not exactly like that back then, but in similar principle, you, were, you weren't in there for years on years and then you became NC NCO because with the whole rotation thing, you need a lot of personnel every year because a lot of personnel gets out into the lawn there in the lunch dorm every year. And then, um, probably on the march, most guys didn't care as long as there was no higher up around. So, uh, which let's be honest makes sense. I mean, it doesn't help you to keep bottomed up, that's for sure. <laughs> now, sort of the British 
equivalent of that in World War II. Surprisingly, in the manuals, they're quite big on encouraging uh, comfort on the march. So uh, they don't insist, they didn't insist on button-up. I suspect that there'd have been a certain tendency amongst officers for their men to always look smart and want to keep buttoned up and what have you. But to add into this, what they did do very differently to now is uh, relatively extreme water discipline. Um, only allowed to swill, if I remember rightly, the phrase is something like, uh, during the hourly rest pause, they, uh, the men should be allowed to swill their mouths out with water, but uh, excessive drinking from the, canti from the water bottle must be um, discouraged. And it was a, a British Imperial Quart, so basically about a litre. Whereas the Swiss, on the other hand, the Feldflasher is this tiny little half litre thing uh, kept inside the uh, bread, bag. bread bag there on the march or, or hung on the belt if you're in lighter order. Um, frankly, more suitable for wine or schnapps than, uh, huh. than water. But can you imagine a Swiss summer where it's like 36 degrees, you're up in the Jura and it's or up in the Alps and it's sun baked and you've got this tiny little, tiny little half litre water bottle to survive with. But um, you've got a hydration pack in there. Oh yeah, yeah. The thing is, we're still doing this for fun. <laughs> we're not making like living history or anything. And um, there's just a couple of things on the march I don't mess with. This, that's my feet. I mean, I'm wearing my marching boots, good socks and hydration. That's just, yeah. Any idiot can rough it. <laughs> I mean, we're, 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 we're making use of uh, a brunner of uh, water troughs whenever possible. I'm carrying two liters of water. Yeah, I have three in my bag and that should be enough. Yeah, and uh, oh, Chappie? I've got two liters. Two, two liters of water and how much wine? Uh, <laughs> oh, the standard, 75. Oh, okay, because <laughs> But that does, that's not counted in the weight, because... No, because it's consumable. It's be consumable, yeah. eventually. Yeah. <laughs> Fizzy, warm. <laughs> anyway, I think at the next stop, we'll go on with some kit. Yeah. So we're in close now to where the uh, Confederates and their allies were uh, marshalled and uh, I suspect this looked quite different back then. Uh, incoming cavalry. Oh no, Burgundian cavalry sighted! Right, <laughs> How about no? <laughs> so Pascal has the oldest equipment so he's going first. Yeah, um, top to bottom. Okay, top to bottom. Um, Ordnance 1940 field cap, kind of uh, early um, early 1890s style Swiss or later on German mountain field cap style. Um, then the uniform is a 1926 pattern, basically the same as uh, 1914, except they could like put the color down here with a pair of buttons. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, regular ammo pouches with Y straps, nothing special. Boots are my KS90 boots because I don't mess with the feet on the march. Uh, then the backpack is, uh, or the Polnister is a pattern of uh, 1898, I believe. Uh, yeah, it's cowhide. And um, I got on there the steel helmet, uh, brass bag with. Um, mess kit which is um, the bread bag is a post-war pattern but um, yeah the whole packing thing what I put inside is basically um, an estimation kind of or I started out with uh, the gear that um, according to the booklets that uh, soldiers need to uh, make once they get into service also um, zum Einrücken Packung erstelle, erstelle Packung zum Einrücken that stuff so once they get into a service period soldiers in the Swiss Army keep most of the stuff with them at home and get like a few few things like tents and uh, entrenching tools they get issued once they're in service. So uh, they basically fill up their, uh, their backpack with clothes and uh, socks and stuff like that and towels. I didn't do that because first off I need um, I need place for my uh, uh, for my uh, Hydration Water. system. Yeah, hydration system, thanks. And um, I, the other option would be putting clothes and all that stuff on the outside. 
which I want, didn't want to do, so I approximated the weight of it just with basically making that um, just uh, instead of using clothes and so on, I just used the tent, the half tent and uh, the tent packs. Yeah, back the just tent, tent pegs up there. Yeah. We've got great coat rolled up and we've got the felt bar, the, uh, the, 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 the everything yeah. sheet used as a as uh, waterproof sand as shelter and so on. Yeah, so um, all together it's um, roughly about, like, according to the book it would be roughly about 23 kilos. It's a little less but still way more than I actually would need to carry for the march. So, um, you know, <laughs> that's r roughly about it. Are you toasty warm? At the moment it's working out because we have a little breeze that's cooling me down a little bit, so at the moment it's working quite well. well we found that last year, was that the, the wool uniform is much more comfortable than people would imagine. Yeah. Well it's scratchy, but you know, not that bad. Alright. Okay. I have got, throw back to the 80s, uh, French mixture of F1 and F2 uh, outfit. Um, it is green, interesting point, because uh, in France the Metropolitan Troops kept the green uniform, they didn't have camouflage. Um, post the Algerian crisis, there was the General's Putsch in 1961, and at that point they only used the, uh, the leopard print in uh, expeditionary and colonial situations. Um, Lizard print. Yes, leopard. I was leopard. Yeah, okay. <laughs> officially. Uh, so I have the F1 helmet, which I'm not wearing because it weighs about one and a half kilos, but it's complete. So that's in the pack as part of my weight. This is a uh, the large rucksack, which telescopes another height's worth. Uh, there is a small pack as well, usually. I've got two mag pouches, each for three mags. Apparently awful in use. And uh, this is my ANP51 gas mask bag with gas mask and apple. I don't have a filter and I'm not crazy so I'm not actually going to wear it. Uh, small med pack with blister pluses. <laughs> um, yeah, apart from that, it's it's extremely comfortable. Uh, it's a uh, cotton polyester mix. And I've got the F1 shirt underneath which is a sort of Airtex breathing uh, fabric, also very comfy. And perhaps the worst bit are the uh, Patton 56 boots with integrated uh, putties, jambières, which are extremely good at making your feet fit the boots. Oh, <laughs> nice. Uh, so at the moment they're all right. I think I might get some rubbing on the top of my toes. Feels all right for the moment. And we're about 11, 11k in. Oh yeah, but both our GPS things decided that they were going to not work properly. Yeah, so we're, so we're relying on the map. From now on. And we're relying on the map. Yeah. So uh, yeah, and in, in terms of actual weight for the challenge, I have a uh, Swiss blanket, which is three kilos in itself. And uh, the rest, seven kilos of lead, deconsecrated lead. <laughs> So I've gone for a mixture of British Cold War army surplus and Marasalika, some of clothing. This is the, uh, the famous Sarma windproof set, which is part of the uh, unofficial, semi-official bloke on the range uniform, um, which is styled after the British windproofs. So it's kind of appropriate and I don't really want to be cutting around in a full camouflage uniform doing something like this. So uh, works perfectly for me, um, got a nice, nice breeze going through the arm vents right now. I've just got a t-shirt under it. Now possibly the more interesting thing is the 58 pattern um, webbing in combat equipment fighting order set up. And what this consists of is a belt that's adjustable but not easily, um, two ammo pouches, the, the early ones were straight and then they slanted them, one water bottle pouch size not really big enough for the water bottle, particularly when it shrinks when wet. Um, it's kind of early 80s setup, so I've got a respirator case with uh, an S6 respirator in it. The two kidney pouches on the back. This is the interesting thing because that replaced, functionally replaced the haversack worn high on the back from the 37 pattern and 44 
pattern equipment and we have a proper modern yoke modern-ish yoke um, now one of the innovations here was a proper yoke rather than cross straps um, the theory is that it moves the weight onto the hips and I'm not quite sure I've got this set up quite right because I've got more weight on my shoulders than I would like um, but compared to last year which if you remember I was I was running 30, 37 pattern equipment this is infinitely more comfortable uh, to make up the weight um, it's, it was fairly heavy already just with the respirator in it we were already at about four or five kilos just on just on that so with the tripod and then I've got a three kilo dumbbell um, it's made up to um, 10 kilos before water and food as in what it should be um, I'm hoping I don't end up draining both liters of water I've got one in the kidney pouch um, which in reality you wouldn't be able to do because you had all the, all your stuff to function for 24 plus hours uh, in there oh the other thing is the bum roll sorry I just forgot to mention the bum roll um, I have a poncho that's why it's that's why hang on did I get my weight wrong I, I didn't sleep very well last night and uh, <laughs> um, but anyway anyway yeah the, there's a there's a poncho here this is my waterproof or my shelter which I'm not going to use obviously uh, boots wise I got a foot problem last year developed plantar fasciitis um, so I'm not taking any risks I'm just wearing my normal hiking boots so there you go um, I, I think of the military gear this is by far the more comfortable of that any of the three of us are wearing and I'm fighting with the tap here um, imagine doing that on a two-way range after you've taken a magazine out um, oh just for info the standard the standard um, loading was three SLR magazines in here one on the rifle and then grenades and pyro in here it wasn't I mean you can in principle hold six magazines and if you're carrying GPMG ammunition it ended up in a rucksack or down your front or whatever there is a large pack that goes on it for combat equipment marching order it is utterly horrible and hangs off of these tabs and as I understand it people were forced to use it during basic training and then just ditched it for whatever rucksack they could get their hands on whether civilian or, or issued and um, if you take the kidney patches off you and the bum roll off you've got a skeleton order but anyway there you go you probably wanted to fast forward through that bit because it was a boring ramble so we made it to Ulmitz which is about halfway but this is the uh, Swiss marshalling area and I hadn't appreciated this until we actually saw it coming down into it is that it's in a bowl with a sort of babbling brook small creek running through it this is a brilliant place to encamp your forces because you can stick scouts up on the high points this is dead ground Burgundians are over that way um, they've got to sort of come up to the edge of the bowl to be able to see in so you can you're fairly sheltered down here and this would have been uh, mostly fields you can encamp your substantial forces so the next question is who and what were the forces on each side and um, on the Burgundian side they had about 22,000 men including 5,700 archers 5,100 infantry 2,100 heavy cavalry it was a professional army which is a point that becomes important later um, and it inc also included contingents from Italy and Savoy and 900 English mercenary archers. Uh, the Swiss uh, was the Bernese, I'm not going to go down the full list because I'll miss some people off, the Swiss and their, and their allies. Um, so there were about 24,000 men mostly armed with pikes, halberds and battle axes and there are also small groups with bows, crossbows and early sort of arquebuses and there are 80, about 1800 cavalry who are mostly allies from Austria and Lorraine since the Swiss didn't have any of their own and it's a conscript army just raised from the uh, from the villages farmers bring their pokey things effectively um, you'll notice a disparity in the style there um, and this was reflected in the tactics that we used the Burgundians um, tended to use their ranged weapons so their their large numbers of bowmen artillery to soften up formations and then run into the side of them with heavy cavalry when they were suitably disorganized the Swiss on the other hand being mostly hand-to-hand -hand weapons fought in what was called a Gewalthaufen and it's very difficult to translate this literally into English so literally it's like <laughs> violence formation um, <laughs> violence they, <pile. laughs> it's 
Yeah, okay. and I'll put some. I'll put some some pictures up, some 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 drawings of this. But the, they'd form into three groups. There'd, there'd be a Vorhut, which would be a smaller version of this. The Gewalthaufen, who do most of the the fighting, and the and the um, Nachhut, with a sort of rear guard who would go th who would go through. Um, and basically, it was a formation of a, a sort of ring of pikemen, several multiple ranks deep, with halberdiers behind, so protecting the halberdiers. And the pikes can hold off enemy infantry, enemy cavalry. They're about five meters long. This is an era when sort of the average height is tiny. Um, these were big, pointy things. And uh, what they would do is hold off the enemy infantry or cavalry, get stabby with them. Once they're in sufficient disarray, the, uh, the halberdiers can run between the ranks, get stabby and hacky with them, retreat back in, rinse and repeat. And it's basically, it's, in a way, the way it was fought is similar to the uh, Napoleonic column. It has a lot of momentum. You've got an awful lot of people there um, who, uh, who have a lot of momentum just to, just to carry it through, carry the attack. Um, and you can you can see how the two tactics are sort of meant to be, sort of countering each other effectively based on on what was on what was at hand. Now this is where they encamped. So anyway, onwards and onwards. So just up near the lip of the bowl, sort of on the Burgundian side, and you can see why they chose this place to park more than twenty thousand troops. There's enough room in this dead ground where the Burgundians have limited opportunity to observe them. So, well chosen, guys. You are right, Pascal? I'm fine. Just some shade for the neck. Should we uh, try and get you a lift on the... Uh... <laughs> now then we'll be cheating, would it? Absolutely. Back to that game one. So we're just having a little water break and I thought I'd show you where we came from and where we're going to. So we started there, we're going to there, we're there, so we're more than halfway. And we went all the way along there, all the way along there, all the way up there, all mitts, that's the, the marshalling area. And then the Swiss line of advance was in this direction and we'll get there in a bit and uh, show you what they formed up in this wood here and attacked the um, Burgundian main defence line which was sort of ran along there between Salvanach and the Bergburg Schlucht there and then we're gonna hang, swing south there and go wibbly 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 and end up there so I think we've done all right So there's Lurtigan through the trees there, and that would have been the open area, sort of a linear village, so the fields would have stretched either side of it, and uh, that's really where you're going to be moving the bulk of your tens of thousands of men, not down uh, little tracks in the forest like this. Hey, can you just imagine tens of thousands of Halbarden pike armed troops moving up into that forest, that little woodland there? To, uh, to go into battle, just... Because this is the ground over which it happened. I think that's... Would have looked like a separate little forest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah forest of uh, five meter long pikes being moved into a birch for forest there that separates the Galmbald, which is this, and the Muttenholz, which is over, over the top there. Um, we don't often see, I mean, aside from like football stadiums full of people, it's difficult to visualize what 20,000 troops looks like. So this is basically the uh, Swiss line of departure, the edge of the forest. This is the modern forest, don't know where the edge of the uh, historic one is, but it's a few hundred meters from the Burgundian main line of defense, the uh, so-called Grünhag, which went from Salvanach village over there up to the Burggraben over that way where the artillery was sighted. So um, what I'll do at another occasion is I'll explore this whole line and show you a much greater lay of the land, but uh, sort of this wood line is where 
the Gewalt Haufen would have uh, would have come out of to attack the Grunhag a few hundred meters that way. We're going to go through the line of the Grunhag and then swing around and end up over there. And you can see that hill out the back there. And you'll see why the location of the um, of the chapel is entirely improbable because the uh, the Burgundian cavalry block will have been just over there so that it can come around the edge of the Grunhag. But um, yeah, I think it's these these little. Myths and legends are always very interesting. So there's the outskirts of Salvanach and the Grunhag would have gone somewhere along that, roughly that line there. Don't know exactly where it is, but it's gonna be in this area and the land starts to drop off a bit in that direction. So it's probably somewhere around here. And it was a palisade and ditch. So a big, strong uh, wooden fence with a ditch in front of it. Um, and the Swiss would have had to cross that open ground, however wide it was back in the day, to get to it. So, shall we? That way. That way? That way. That way. That way. Left, right, centre. So this area is behind the Burgundian front lines. It's the hill I mentioned before. That's Cressier. And the chapel is beyond Cressier, it's over there. It's like not convinced that commanders should be swinging that far behind enemy lines, really. I mean, it would have to be a really special shrine, but there's a huge risk of getting caught and cut off and run down and stuff, so that's why I think it's rather implausible. A uh, little lunch break time at the chapel. I've got some um, rye bread, some corned beef because I like it, and some cheeses. Now for lunch we have a uh, Chateau Lafitte Lojac Medoc 2018. Because Burgundy was too expensive. Exactly. <laughs> Alright, so cheers. Well, cheers. That's all right, that is. Yep. So, after lunch, here we are at the famous chapel. Legend has it that uh, before the battle, the, the Swiss commanders prayed here. As we've already shown, this seems to me to be rather unlikely. This is not the original construction. Uh, that burned down, as these things had a habit of doing. Uh, it was renovated in uh, 1767, and then in the 19th century, it had a little bell tower without a bell added to have been upgraded over time. Uh, for those of a religious nature, it is Catholic. This is Fribourg, which is, I believe, mostly Catholic. But uh, yes, it is, um, it is a Catholic chapel. And of course, back in the day, this is pre-Protestant, so every, all the, everyone on each side would have been Catholic anyway. But the question is, was there actually a Swiss commander? And the answer seems to be, no, there wasn't. Each unit had its own commander, and they um, they rather had a had a little sort of committee and decided on the big questions like that. Um, and there's some hundred-year-old scholarly work I saw trying to work out what the question was, because various historians over time have said it was him, it was him, it was him. These names would mean nothing to people outside Switzerland, and even nothing to pe most people inside Switzerland. So I won't go into these in detail, but it was uh, it, it was a sort of Allied army run by committee, which I think is quite interesting. Now, all of our feet are throbbing. <laughs> We've got about five, six kilometers to go to the end. Um, we're gonna go up through the woods over there, drop down, up onto the Bodomunzi, which was Charles's command post, and uh, then down to the War Memorial and uh, finish up. So, there we go. Well, thank you for that. What? <laughs> Showing the people how we suffer. Pulling that stuff on. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, that's it. So, at risk of jinxing the last five or six k, um, this has certainly been easier than last year. I mean, it's a route with far less height gain. Oh, yeah. um, it's been warmer, uh, but then we're wearing much more modern equipment. I mean, the wool, 
Pascal is suffering. And, well, it's not as bad. It's nowhere near as bad as you think. Yeah. But it's not as good as a t-shirt and a windproof. Or well, your Gucci French gear. Yeah. Nice. This, this is the F1 shirt. It just soaks up moisture. But it doesn't feed, go through to this. Ah, nice. 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 So you've got a cooling layer in between against your skin. Well thought out. But it's always the hardest getting moving again after yeah. a break, and particularly a break when you've eaten lunch, not just a couple of bits of Coca Cola. So, uh, anyway, this is the way we're going. So, coming down out the woods, we get the first glimpse at the bottom of the sea and the town of Merton down there by the lake. So, we are nearly there. Okay, so we made it to the Bodomuncy, which is a hill overlooking Merton, there, upon which Charles perched his tent, um, giving himself a commanding view of the battlefield and the expected destruction. Now, he actually expected a Swiss attack on the 21st of June, and he had all the defences, particularly the Grunhag, uh, fully, fully manned. Uh, the Swiss decided that they were going to delay to await the arrival of a contingent from Zurich, who did a three-day forced march and arrived in the middle of the night uh, from the 21st to the 22nd. Um, on the 22nd, it was raining, which is not ideal campaigning weather, and Charles thought the Swiss would keep delaying, and mid-morning he made the most fatal error of this entire story. He decided to pay his entire army. He left the Grunhag manned with about 2,000 troops, and caused chaos basically by opening the uh, opening the treasury up everyone queuing up to pay eating lunch and so on now around midday while all this was going on the Swiss formed up in fighting order and attacked out of the woods we saw earlier uh, and butted up into the main line of defenses um, they didn't take it immediately they didn't just roll it it, it it took a it took a little while but it was fairly quick and they rolled it there's no view from here you, you, even without the forest, you can't actually see over. There's another sort of row of hills before the Grunhag. So Charles is relying on runners on horseback to get messages back and forth. Um, basically, once they've broken through the Grunhag, uh, they rolled up the entire position. And imagine all this area down, down here, or the flatter area outside the town, um, as basically a campsite for 20,000 odd soldiers, um, caught by surprise by this great big medieval phalanx of thousands and thousands and thousands of pikemen and halberdiers basically rampaging through a campsite and the Burgundians tried to rally the troops a few times and there were some small groups that attacked this, uh, this the violent mob this big violent mob and got violently mobbed um, basically they were fighting on a, on a terrain that was not of their choosing they weren't organized to fight there they had all their baggage and tents and everything else there and basically they got pwned um, Burgundians were in absolute chaos, and then uh, the Lombard, there was a, a left hook around to the south uh, against the Lombardians, which forced them towards the lake, down there to the, to the west of the town, more or less where the memorial is, which is where we're going to next, and uh, the garrison of the town made a sally out into their flank. Uh, they were pushed into the, into, into the water, and uh, the garrison in boats got all stabby with them, and uh, rather hacked them up. Um, so the Swiss having reached the lake shore, they cut off the Burgundian line of retreat and it was just an absolute massacre. And um, basically casualties, according to reports, are a mere 400 on the Swiss side, take that with a pinch of salt if you want, around 10,000 on the Burgundian side, and we'll talk a bit more uh, along those lines down at the, at, at the, at the War Memorial. But uh, yeah, if you can imagine this huge, huge, great um, Gewalthaufen just rampaging through the camp against un unprepared, un unorganized 
Burgundians and their baggage train. It's just, uh, just absolute slaughter. I think these two in army boots are suffering more feet-wise than I am in my Gucci uh, lower boots. And the end point heaves into view finally. The obelisk. The war memorial. <sighs> we made it. Yay. Okay, so we reached the end. Here we are at the uh, um, very attractive war memorial here. And um, so, what was the aftermath of the battle? Well, Charles the Bold retreated once again into his territories and uh, within a year, he was a goner. Funnily enough, at the hands of Swiss mercenaries fighting for the Lorraine, oh, Lorrainers who were fighting to get their state back. Um, he had no male heirs, which meant that the, the duchy was then broken up between uh, Royal France and the Habsburg Empire. Um, France regained Burgundy as we know it today and uh, the northern Brabant, um, Luxembourg and Flanders then became Habsburg. So um, as we said before there were about 10,000 dead on the uh, Burgundian side and according to custom uh, they were left to, left to uh, ferment for three days and uh, then the landowners had to bury them into the ground and um, then later they would be exhumed and put into mass graves. Now about 10 years later they were dug up again and uh, put it into an ossuary which uh, well ossuary or bone house and um, this was where the obelisk now stands and um, actually the field behind the bloke over there is called the Bonehouse Field. So uh, there we go. Now uh, unfortunately they were not laid here to rest forever. Uh, when Napoleon inv invaded in 1796. 98. 98, thank you. There was this musicians of the 75th Half Brigade who were actually from Burgundy uh, destroyed the ossuary. Bit of vindictiveness there. Um, Apparently they tried to blow it up with 30 to 40, to 40 pounds of gunpowder. Um, so then the bones were reburied, and in uh, 1822, after the, the fall of Napoleon, this was then erected. So that brings the whole saga to a close. So also, this ends our Varsalika Remote Military March 2021 saga as well. How are the feet? Um, they hurt in different ways from last year, but overall better. Kit, much better. <laughs> well, tip of my toes, a little bit uh, knackered on, but other than that, not too bad for the feet. Backpack, on the other hand, that's a little bit different story. But yeah. uh, it worked out, it was fun, actually. Enjoyed it. My feet are far better than last year, aren't totally wrecked. Um, I think I've probably got bigger blisters on my hips from this than I do on my feet, uh, which is a massive improvement. And that kit is a massive improvement over 37 pounds. So anyway, uh, if you survived this far, thank you so much for watching. Please consider supporting us on Patreon if you haven't already done so. Thank you so much, Pascal, for coming to uh, be the third wheel. <laughs> and uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed yourself and we'll do, it, do it together again next year. Shame it didn't work out last year because of your terrible foot injury. Oh yeah, that was bad. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, thanks a lot, and uh, see you again sometime. Bye.